Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're enjoying um, our Data AI Summit right now. Um, and thank you for joining this breakout session today. Um, uh, Hitish Sadhani will be presenting about DHL uh, e-commerce story. And uh, Hitish is actually a um, head of the cloud data platform and solutions. And he's responsible for uh, developing and scaling global cloud data management capabilities. So please welcome Hitish. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining here today for this session. Um, very excited to be here on behalf of uh, my team and DHL in general to be presenting this session uh, and sharing our journey of building a cloud data platform and uh, how we basically navigated through the challenges that we saw and how we came up with a robust and scalable data platform that would help really in the end to generate business value. So this is really like some real experiences from the field, first-hand experiences that I'm going to share today with you. So hopefully uh, this, uh, you find it useful. Uh, we'll have some time towards the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to um, like ask them uh, during the Q&A session. So before we uh, jump into the real topic, um, I think it's uh, maybe important to give you a bit more information about uh, DHL, right, as a company, DPDHL group, so who we are. Um, just some key highlights, right? So um, obviously we can talk a lot about the group itself, it's, it's huge. Uh, but just to give you an idea of the scale, so overall um, DPDHL group operates uh, worldwide in more than 222 countries and territories. It's the world lead, leading logistics company around the world. Most international company in that sense employs over 600,000 uh, people across the world. Last year, for example, group reported revenue of 94 billion, um, just to give you like some idea of the scale. Uh, within the group, uh, also uh, just quick one-liners about the core divisions of the group. So group consists of five main business divisions, uh, mainly uh, post and parcel, express, so all the, the ones in the middle that you see um, are, are the ones um, that are doing the core business for the group, so they have their own speciality and focus. Uh, Deutsche Post is um, post and parcel. Deutsche Post, the, the one on the very left that you see, is the one, um, it's, it's the German leading post and parcel company uh, that is providing post and parcel services in Germany and uh, outbound services in Europe. DHL Express, one of the largest um, express carrier delivery service, if, if I could say like that. So they have around 300 uh, aircrafts worldwide that they operate. I think quite impressive, uh, equivalent to some large airline companies as well in that sense. Supply chain uh, offers tailor-made and uh, tailor-made logistic services and supply chain solutions uh, based on standardized you know, modules in the supply chain world like warehousing, um, inventory management, order fulfillment, distribution, likewise right, many other similar services. Uh, Global Forwarding Freight is our international uh, forwarding services uh, division for ocean, air, and overland freight. And uh, it has also around 200 terminals across the world uh, where uh, we have our hubs, uh, where we load all the containers and ship the containers. Uh, DHL e-commerce solution, right? So this is the entity that we are going to talk about, one of the entities of DHL e-commerce solution uh, today. So DHL e-commerce solution is our uh, last mile delivery uh, business unit, which does uh, domestic last mile parcel delivery in a uh, lot of countries across the world. Uh, mainly the focus uh, here is to do um, inbound and outbound parcel delivery for different countries within and uh, across the countries as well. Um, so main, main focus here is non-time definite international shipment delivery. Um, again, to give you an idea of the scale of DHL e-commerce solutions, uh, they deliver over 1.5 billion parcels in an year, for example, right? Uh, and then there are various other supporting uh, units and uh, teams within the group that support these divisions in doing their core work and their core business, right? So with that, uh, let me give you a quick glimpse about now DHL e-commerce US because this is uh, like the entity whose case study we are going to look into today and their journey. 
So I think it's important to understand a little bit about their uh, business and, and what is their business model. So very quickly, DHL Commerce US is a high volume B2C international and domestic parcel delivery business, mainly operating in US, so 90% of the business is in US. So out of the 1.5 billion parcels that I talked about that globally DHL e-commerce solution ships, um, more than half a billion is done by e-commerce US. So they are one of the biggest entities within DHL e-commerce US, uh, within DHL e-commerce overall, and uh, they have overall 24 distribution centers here in US, uh, with three distribution centers being the uh, international ones which are also doing the outbound delivery. Uh, I think at the surface, it looks very simple, right? What a parcel company does, ships parcel from point A to point B, right? But obviously behind the scenes, there's a complex network, sophisticated set operations, right? Significant set of steps that are followed to make sure that parcels are shipped reliably at such a high volume from point A to point B. So just again to quickly have a sense of, you know, what kind of things go behind the scenes, there are tons of business processes that are happening when a parcel is being picked up from one place and shipped to another place. So it could be anywhere locally uh, to another city, to another region, and then the country, right? So there could be a lot of different uh, target and target points. And that's where uh, DHL e-commerce US has built a very, uh, I would say, uh, sophisticated network over a period of time. And just to give you an idea again, uh, how, how really it works behind the scenes so that you know we, you could follow along uh, when we talk about in the next slides bit about the business context and the business value e-commerce US is generating. So when a customer decides to ship a parcel with DHL or like high volume parcels or shipments with DHL, um, they might query our API to generate labels, they might place orders on our website then uh, these shipments get picked up, they get delivered to our terminal origin, terminal di distribution center. Then from there on, there is a series of steps that happens within the distribution center before these parcels could be routed to the destination. Like um, when the parcel is received, there's a manual verification process that happens at the distribution center. Then there is a process of encoding, sorting, manifestation, and then the final sort uh, rerouting is done to the destination distribution center, which again could be either a local distribution center, if depending on the target zip code of the parcel where it needs to be shipped is in the same city. If it's a different target city, then obviously it goes from one place from that uh, distribution center to another distribution center where again, same set of process. So, so the core idea behind telling this uh, aspect is to get a feeling how much of data we are generating at each leg of the operation, right? So there's a huge, humongous amount of data that's been generated at every step, and with the volume of parcels that we operate, we do really track events or capture the events for each and every parcel uh, that comes as part of the shipments from the customer. So obviously, with so much amount of data being generated, uh, right, uh, ECS US organization, or for that matter, I think any organization would want to be, uh, let's say, really keen to leverage the potential of this data. I mean, we all now are in Data AI Summit, right? Needless to say or, or emphasize the importance of data. So this is where uh, ECSUS organization then uh, decided to go on a mission to be a data-driven organization, right? And, and really enable all the decision-making in their organization data-driven and maximize the value, business value. Uh, but obviously, right, before you could do that, there are tons of challenges uh, in an organization if you are, let's say, not into this business, right? Your core business is something else and you're generating tons of data, but obviously you're not collecting them for analytics before. So uh, there were different business teams, right? So there was a need that uh, different business teams in the ECS organization uh, felt the need to leverage also this data. They started building analytics use cases. Um, and and the, obviously the, the major challenge that they ran into was really possibility to get data, right? And, and really retrieve the data from different sources where they are collected, um, update or integrate this data from different sources, right, as they need for their use case. So they were really having hard time and challenges in uh, delivering their use cases because of the challenge of even getting the data at first place. And then needless to say, right, all the other challenges that would come as you, you know, progress in your journey like uh, for example, um, the source systems in the organization was only capturing last two months of data, right? Now, if, if uh, for certain analytics and, and especially machine learning AI, if you need historical data for last one year, 
Um, there was no chance, right, that teams could get this data because this was not being captured anywhere or stored for longer duration. And then, obviously, um, as multiple teams start to operate and l run large-scale, um, let's say, computation and analytics processes, they run into scale performance, perform uh, performance issues, right? So list is long, right? So this is just some key bullet points, right, um, of the challenges that the team faced when they decided to be really data driven. And that's where they realized, right, that they definitely need a centralized data platform, right, where teams can get what they need, business teams, and they don't have to worry about all these challenges, but could really focus on the business value and generating value out of this data. So this is where, uh, you know, uh, then a goal was being set up with the management that, okay, we need a centralized enterprise and unified uh, data platform where teams could get like a central centralized and let's say access to this central repository of the data at one place. So they don't have to now go to 10 systems if they need data from their ERP systems or CRM systems or from their operational systems. And most important of that all, right, the idea was to build a unified platform in the sense that now um, Today, if the primary focus is to cover like BI reporting kind of use cases, and tomorrow, once we have this repository of data, and if we want to do machine learning AI, now we should not have to build um, another data platform, right? So we really wanted to avoid data silos. So um, these are really some uh, you know core workload patterns that we identified that were really prominent, which we wanted to cover through the capabilities of such a unified platform. So be it you know large scale data processing in form of data engineering, whether uh, some power users want to do data engineering and, and process some large amounts of data for making that available for ad hoc analysis, or be it reporting UI, uh, reporting or dashboarding, or be it machine learning data science, right? And obviously, needless to say, streaming data analytics uh, in, in our world is also equally important today. Uh, so how did we do that, right? So that's the key. Um, so I mean, we came up with this generic architecture to really support this uh, vision and this goal uh, where we can build really a centralized uh, repository of data which is scalable, but also it offers end-to-end -end data management capabilities because uh, remember the pain point, right, that we had with the business teams. I, I, I could imagine some of you would have already faced in your organizations as well. So really the pain point was that business teams had hard time to really make use of any data or a lot of times even give up because they could not get the data. So it was also about you know, driving that culture change, and, and for that, then we needed a platform that can scale, and it, we don't have to worry when things start working about you know, uh, the robustness and the scalability of the platform, be it in terms of data storage, computing capabilities, or accessibility of the data. Now, how did we do it, right? So at the core of it, if you look at it, uh, we leveraged the data lake architecture. Um, so that's where you see uh, the, the layer data lake storage uh, layer there, right, where we leverage open file formats like Parquet and Delta Lake. Um, another important aspect you would see is uh, that we try to cover end-to-end -end data management capabilities. So all the way from ingestion up to the data delivery, everything in between, be data processing, data transformation, um, access of the data, orchestration of the pipelines, everything, right? So the end users can really focus on generating their business value. And some other important things to note here is right, this entire architecture and platform when we started building was uh, powered by automation. And, and I think in cloud, I can emphasize that this is very important if you want to have a consistent and a repeatable approach uh, to uh, deploying your stuff consistently and repeatedly, which will happen in the cloud because you know, that's where you want to leverage the power of the cloud. So that's where you see this bottom layer of DevOps, automation, security, and governance where all these things are centrally managed and controlled. Uh, in terms of the data architecture, uh, just a few words quickly about the layers, right? Uh, what were the purpose of these layers? I think most of you know this uh, uh, from Databricks Medallion architecture as well. Um, purpose is almost the same, little bit tweaked as per the purpose of our organization, right, where we felt the need to have little bit of differences. So landing layer is equivalent to branch layer, where, which is the entry point to the platform for any data, where all the raw data sits in its raw format, no access uh, here by default to the end users. Then the data, if data needs any processing, then this moves to the output layer. Um, and this landing and output layer would form the core of the platform. This, so this would provide the 
let's say, the data foundation for the business user. So this is where multiple business teams sitting in the business layer, each with their own separate spaces, this is what we are going to see uh, uh, shortly, um, can tap onto the same copy of the data without having to onboard the same data again, which previously they had to do each time. And, and this way we were avoiding the data silos. Um, and what is also very important uh, that we followed in this architecture, this is also I think an important learning that we had firsthand, is to be able to decouple your ingestion, processing, and let's say use case workloads. Because uh, if now you have a common found data foundation which you want multiple teams to consume the data from, and if one of your business use cases have issues in their jobs, and if you have tight dependency between ingestion you know, and other processing and use case jobs, then you impact everyone. So it was very important to have this decoupling between the ingestion processing layers and the use case layers. So we followed here also you know, separate compute architecture, followed proper workload isolation, which I'm going to shortly touch also in the next slide. Okay, so with that, uh, Technically, what services did we use? So we are on Azure, right? We build this platform on Microsoft Azure. This is very, uh, I think, important if you are on Azure. Also, uh, you know, just to understand what services we used and uh, little bit of details, obviously, just in interest of time, we'll not be able to go into all the details, but a uh, little bit of details about all of these services, how we use them. Uh, so for pure data ingestion and pure data copy, so like really data copy from outside world to the landing layer, we used Azure Data Factory. Um, then uh, once the data is in the landing layer for any processing whatsoever, that's where we heavily use Databricks and we leverage the power of Spark and Databricks there. And we have really a huge scale of pipelines and objects now refreshing continuously every half an hour or even 15 minutes. Uh, in production from like last one and a half, two years. So we have really tested some of these services to their limits as well in this platform. And we have uh, gone through various performance optimization exercises as well. Uh, so ADF is used for data ingestion and end-to-end -end data orchestration. So which is the final piece that you see here in the slide, the last piece. Um, Spark data breaks for data processing, uh, use case layer processing. Uh, for any compute that's needed in the platform that was mainly provided by Databricks for ETL or data processing kind of workloads. Then the final, I think it's very important, right? Uh, once you start bringing data into the data lake, uh, you should be able to make this data available for consumption, right? So that's where it was very important to also have an easy to use query layer or sometimes called as a serving layer in different architectures. So this is where we leverage uh, Synapse serverless, and uh, now we are also evaluating Databricks SQL for a most um, like more performant engine. But today we use Synapse serverless for due to its cost efficiency. So just to again like uh, highlight like Synapse serverless because sometimes could be confusing. It's not the Synapse data warehouse product, the dedicated SQL pool, the serv but it's the serverless other engine which is the data lake query engine. So using serverless. Uh, we built our own metadata of all the data that we are bringing into the lake, and we are able to build that metadata layer in Synapse Serverless, and tomorrow we could also extend this with this architecture also in Databricks SQL, or for that matter, on, on top of any other engine. So this also allows us to be, like, really build an open lake house architecture at the end of the day, right? Uh, with regards to the storage, I think it's an obvious choice, right, when you're in Azure. So if you are uh, having a data lake architecture, so Azure Data Lake Gen 2 is an obvious choice. It's optimized for big data workloads. Um, one important detail that you also see here highlighted is, uh, I think it's very important, right, not, that you not only define, you know, at top level, like, you know, what Medellin architecture tells you that, okay, have three layers. But I think it's very important from our first hand experience is how do you really, uh, let's say, structure those layers, right? Because that's where a lot of your transparency um, and, and governance of your data could be defined on top of that. So the approach that we followed, right, and that we thought is very scalable to also strike the right balance between not having too many storage accounts or too less storage accounts and then hitting the limits of individual storage accounts uh, was to have one storage account per source system or domain, right? So depending on however you would like to model your data in your organization. So we took this approach of uh, having one storage account per source system in the landing and the output layers that I showed previously in the data architecture. And again, quickly, right, so one more important detail with regards to the storage architecture was, um, or is basically that with, with the landing and output layers, you, we try to keep the mapping uh, 
as much similar as possible to the outside world because then business users are able to better correlate and understand their data because they, also, they already know a lot of their data assets from the individual source systems. And that's where we don't try to change too much in the landing and the output layer. However, when you move to the use case layer, so this is where we allow use cases the flexibility to store the data as they want in their own storage accounts with their own structure. So that way we, we let's say, achieve two purposes, right? On the one hand, we build the common data foundation on which everyone can operate. And at the same time, uh, I think you would agree, like everyone in the organization needs flexibility and then use case teams then are allowed in the end to build their own uh, storage structure as they want in their own space. Okay. Uh, so, apart from those details, right, what were some of the other core principles that we followed that, that helps us continuously and consistently uh, build this and operate this platform in a sustainable way over a period of time? And I think these are, I can emphasize, right, these are some of the really important characteristics that helps you to really operate your platform in an agile manner. So, uh, especially now we're talking about large scale data ingestion and data processing that we enabled on the platform. So how did we do that? We basically followed the metadata driven ingestion framework. I think you uh, would have heard of this term before. If not, so this is mainly about uh, building the reusable data pipeline patterns for the key patterns that you see in your organization. For example, whether you, you are uh, having push kind of loads or pull kind of uh, ingestion workloads you are building incremental data pipelines or full batch load ingestion pipelines or streaming patterns. So for all of these, you build a pipeline design once and then you onboard new source systems and objects onto those pipelines through configs. So this helps you to onboard source systems and objects much, much faster and even you could do it in a self-service way for the end users later. Uh, you could also bring them onto this uh, framework and they could do it on their own because it's just a matter of adding configs when they want to onboard new objects. So this really helps us. It, it allows us that flexibility and uh, speed to onboard large amount of objects in a quicker way and without duplicating or creating too much technical depth where in the, in the password you would end up creating if you are loading for example, 2,000 uh, objects, and then if you're using an ETL tool, you end up creating 2,000 pipelines, right, which is quite a mess then to maintain. Uh, sec uh, first and second thing goes hand in hand, right, I already talked about. Third thing, uh, because we used ADF on the ingestion side of things, and this was also one of the key reasons to use ADF, because we, uh, let's say, uh, wanted to really speed up uh, building this platform. So this platform that I'm talking about that we built uh, and you know some of these pieces that, that I touched uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about the business value that, that we delivered and the amount of use cases that are live. So this all has happened in last one and half year uh, with, with not so big team, right? So definitely we wanted to do it um, you know, in a speedy way but obviously not compromising with uh, you know, standards and architectural patterns and then following the right practices. So this is where we leveraged ADF for uh, integrating to a lot of different kinds of source systems in a fast and reliable way. So we today you will see that we connect to all different kinds of source systems that you can imagine in the data world, be it relational databases, APIs, CRM systems, uh, cloud on-premise systems, right? You name it and we have it. So uh, this is where we leverage ADF for this purpose. Uh, the next thing, uh, workload isolation. I mean, I can tell you this is very important uh, from my experience. And I think in general, uh, when you are building a data platform, uh, because this is the problem of, of you know, the old world that, that people have seen. So this is where cloud architectures really help you and services like Databricks could help you. So how do we enable workload isolation? So the core idea here is that uh, you have hundreds and thousands of jobs running in your system, right? Now you don't want these jobs to have resource contention because of each other. Uh, and they can run independently and complete on time, so you could deliver and ensure some end-to-end -end SLA. And in order to do that, we leverage the concept of job clusters in Databricks, for example, right? And, and you could decide the granularity uh, for which pipelines or which object loads and processing or use case workloads you want to have separate job clusters or you want to share them. And here, behind the scenes, we also leverage the concept of uh, multi-threading and parallelism to run multiple objects on the same cluster and different heavy, let's say, demanding workloads on their own separate clusters, right? So this is the key that we follow along the way to really ensure that the performance and SLAs are not impacted. 
Automation, I mean, as I also mentioned before, is really very important in the cloud world. If you're building a data platform in the cloud world, it's, it's actually considered one of the cloud native ways that uh, you, know, you should automate everything right from day one when you're building or deploying your infrastructure. So here we heavily use Terraform and infrastructure as a code to automate all the infra deployment process and releases. Uh, and needless to say, everything that we do, right, security is baked in because I think security is even more important in the cloud environment, right? Uh, this is a bit of a platform view of the architecture, right? So how did we really enable this multi-tenancy, right? Uh, because idea at the end of the day was to build a unified platform which is shared where you could allow multiple teams to operate in their own flexible way, leveraging the same common data foundation. So. Uh, in this architecture, you'll see that mainly the idea is to divide uh, between the core platform and the use case area. So core platform is where we build all the reusable services, and this is based a little bit on the construct of microservices, right? So the idea is a bit inspired from there, what we followed in this architecture. So to group uh, certain resources which provide a, a set of functionality, right? Like for example, ingestion or processing. So these things together in one resource group, so resource group is an Azure construct, right, as you would know. Uh, so group them together and then uh, deploy and manage them uh, through a single uh, control, basically, right? So for example, if you want to uh, decommission or provision ingestion capability, so there is a template that we have prepared for ingestion resource group where we know we have to deploy an ADF, for example, uh, uh, VM with, uh, ADF integration runtime uh, software, right? So likewise, we have these modules built in and now we could launch multiple environments and actually we have three environments here, right? So dev test broad, which we uh, like can consistently deploy and enhance if, if certain new functionalities or similar components are needed. So one good example is, for example, if we onboard a new source system, every time we need a new storage account and we could do that because we have that centralized and you could do that when you have this construct where you know what resources you want to manage together, what, you, what resources should be managed in a completely different life cycle. And uh, this is where you would see like all this ingestion, processing, query, serving layer. So these are the common components and all the use case area or here in the use case blog or business layer, we allow each team to have their own space in the form of their resource group where they can get a storage account as well as some other resources if they would like to play out or try some things out or if, for example, they would like to have their own data rich workspace to have uh, you know, more, uh, let's say, self-service capability to run their ETL workloads or prepare their final report logic, for example. Uh, obviously, uh, again, right, everything I already touched, right, is powered by automation. So we use Terraform and Azure DevOps, just so that you also know the tech stack behind. Uh, and uh, within our organization, we have this uh, dedicated network connectivity between DHL data centers and Azure data centers. Uh, so this is uh, possible now that with Express Route connectivity, we are able to onboard data in a private and secure manner into the Azure platform, so which is also very important. And with security, right, I, I also wanted to emphasize quickly some key findings um, that we followed along the way was not there right from day one, but we learned the hard way, right, that these are the most important things that you should and must have in your environment if you want to build a secure and in a private, let's say, network-based environment. So starting from the private connectivity, if you're in Azure world, you know uh, the concept of private links and private endpoints. So a lot of services you would know in Azure, like storage accounts and um, um, other public services like databases, right? even Databricks for that matter, have public endpoints, right? So they could be uh, accessed over the internet. So this is what we don't want to have, especially when you're building a data platform because you don't want your data to be uh, you know, running across over the internet in an unencrypted manner. So this is where we leverage private endpoints. So with private endpoints, you could ensure that the traffic remains within the virtual network of the subscriptions of your platform. Uh, with Databricks, I think it's very important that Databricks provides this capability that you could really also deploy Databricks. It's a one-time effort. Once you do that, I think then you are, uh, you could be more secure and comfortable in the sense that the data processed by Databricks clusters would always be within your boundaries of your uh, virtual network again. So when you have a Databricks with VNet injection, your clusters that you launch, whether job clusters or all-purpose clusters, they are going to um, 
be launched within the VNet of your subscriptions and then the data and your storage accounts are also with private endpoints, so now your traffic remains within your environment. Um, if you're using Azure DevOps, uh, you could also leverage by default uh, the public uh, agents that Microsoft provides, but obviously those are public, so uh, the recommendation here is that you should use your own self-hosted agents, uh, which you could set up either as VMs in Azure or if you have your own other uh, ways to have VMs then, then to uh, have that. So this is quickly to give you some idea about our, uh, let's say, scale uh, in terms of data ingestion and data processing, and just to have an idea about what all different kinds of source systems we have integrated. Obviously, some of these terms here are more specific to the organization, but these are like relational database or some other kind of backend system that usually you will also find in your organizations. Um, so we have integrated overall 12 plus different systems. We have um, overall 1,500 data plus use case jobs running in, in our environment, live in production for over one and a half years here. We have onboarded overall close to 1,000 objects. If I talk about like tables or business objects for which we are bringing the data continuously, overall platform has already two plus years of historical data and continues to, yeah, I mean, operate even in a more optimized and sustainable way. Um, overall, we run these pipelines uh, every 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and any above frequency that you could imagine, weekly, monthly, daily. Yeah. Okay, then uh, quickly, uh, just to translate this now bit into, you know, from the technical side into the business value, right? So what has team achieved? And, and maybe this is also a little bit of an indication what business teams can do when you have that underpinning foundation really established for the business team. So uh, we have all these departments on the left side, so these are really the departments of ECSUS organization, different departments uh, who have already built these many BI reports and uh, let's say use cases and even like three advanced analytics or data science machine learning use cases on this platform already are live through this platform. Uh, out of all the 147 reports uh, or BI use cases that you see, uh, obviously they have BI front end, which is Power BI in our organization, but all the data crunching, data manipulation, data preparation for these workloads, uh, these use cases are happening in our platform. So this is what we enabled through this. And, and this was obviously all possible at, at a high speed in the last months, and in especially in the last year, last one year, because we had that data foundation, we were easily able to even onboard new data whenever there was a request to onboard new um, data from business teams. Okay, what does that mean in terms of the business value, uh, right? How really, uh, you know, business is, is using this data, right? So these are some examples of BI reporting use cases. So, um, for example, right, so he, there are, obviously these are now just some examples, some key highlights, but obviously business is doing much more. Um, so they can really measure now with all the data that we have on the platform. They can find out the performance of the different campaigns and programs running in the organization. Uh, they can identify, I mean, even at the operational level, the over-labeled package, the, the in, let's say, incorrectly generated sort codes uh, and labels uh, that then uh, could be you know, rectified, uh, required actions can be taken by the customer teams when they're informed about this. Obviously all this is possible when they have data at hand to do this kind of analysis. Um, finance teams can now figure out uh, the performance of uh, you know, different departments, different business operations. They can generate weekly volumes, revenues, right? Uh, we, they can uh, analyze the profit or loss information by customer, by product, right, by a lot of different dimensions, which previously obviously was much harder because like for this you could imagine a lot of data has to be brought together and, and this is now possible with this platform. And one of the very important, uh, uh, let's say, use case that runs out of this platform and, and I will have a bit of a deep dive here now, uh, is this uh, thing in the middle, uh, packages, quality check, controls and delays. So imagine, I mean, uh, we are being a very high volume uh, parcel delivery business here, so we have a huge volume and scale, right? And it can be a daunting task to ensure quality of service when you're delivering so many parcels and packages across the year. So this is where um, one of our business team's customer service uh, takes this initiative to build this quality control platform where 
the idea is that they want to identify the package, uh, the delays in the containers and the packages when they are shipped across different legs of the operation um, and report that to the concerned teams well in time so that we could ensure timely delivery to the business partners or to our customers, sorry. Yeah. So uh, this is a uh, you know, bit of a deep dive about the same thing that I was talking, right? So this actually, by the way, this use case is one of the very important use cases that is running out of this platform. Uh, I mean, it's so critical that we cannot afford to have now platform down because this is really used in near real time. Uh, not, let's say, in true sense near real time, but like every 15, 30 minutes, the data is refreshed and uh, the business users are looking at this uh, giant, let's say, BI report with uh, tens of pages and hundreds of dashboards on it. Um, and we, like, so this is really an example, right? What could we enable out of such a platform, like not only for analytic purposes, but even for operational purposes to support business. So, uh, and that's why, right, it is so important, right? Because uh, ensuring, as I said, quality of service is, is, is here of paramount importance. Uh, some key technical highlights, right? Why it is also challenging at the same time for us technically to serve this use case out of this platform. And I mean, how did we then do it in the end? So here we are talking about one to two million events that we are capturing every hour uh, from different source systems, right? Uh, that is then translating into hundreds of millions of events that we need to process uh, for last 90 days because this report looks at last 90 days of data because generally our parcels could be in transit, you know, in, in last few days, but also sometimes for some exceptional cases over the last month. So this is where, um, and this data that we're talking about is really transactional in nature. So this is of up, this is upsert type data, right? So we really have to apply upserts on top of the data in the data lake. Now this you can imagine, right, from your experience, this is this is not an easy job. So this is where um, um, we leverage heavily Delta Lake, right, as a technology and data rigs. It's not, let's say, directly highlighted here, but at least you see on the architecture there. So we use data rigs quite heavily for all the processing. Uh, so, and and we have also done like because this this is one of the use cases which have been live on this platform right from the beginning when the platform went live one and a half years back, and we have had the challenge right with the growing volume of data, um, like you know imagine we 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 uh, ship overall e-commerce US ships around half a billion parcels in an year if you. Um, you know, have to work at that scale and apply upserts in every half an hour on, on top of files in the data lake, then you need to ensure that, you know, this is done in a performant manner because you still have to ensure your end-to-end -end SLAs. And for this, um, we also did a lot of optimizations over time for Delta Lake. Um, so we also use optimizations from data risk like Photon, a um, lot of other, you know, built-in optimizations that Delta Lake provides like, um, low shuffle merge, adaptive query execution, right? So a lot of other things that we can go into the details later, but just for now, right? So the bottom line is we were able to keep or bring the performance, uh, let's say, uh, so, sorry, bring the execution time down to half, so literally doubling the performance at the same cost, right? Which is a key thing if you could do that at the same cost in the cloud environment, right? So this is where, um, it's uh, like, you know, one of the advantages of using Databricks and Delta Lake here that we could leverage that aspect and, and you know, still run this in a performant manner end to end. So technically, uh, right, how did we do it? It's, it's the same architecture what I showed you before, but just only specific now to this use case. So it's the same layer storage architecture. We bring data to the landing layer. We process it in the output layer, consolidate it basically. When I say process, it's basically the main operation is consolidation, which is applying the upserts. And then the use case logic is prepared in the use case layer, which is then served through Power BI every half an hour. Okay. Uh, quickly about uh, like one of the machine learning AI use cases, right? So here I will not go today into the details of you know how we did this use case, but what I wanted to highlight was now such use cases are also possible through such platform because this is a classic example where you need multiple years of data to come up with you know good recommendations uh, out of your ML model, right? And and let's say more uh, reliable results from your ML model. And here, this is also a good example where you could see we were able to tap into like last two years plus of operational data of the parcel that we have shipped, uh, other customer relevant data. So this is a customer churn uh, use case, right, where we predict um, which customers are at risk or, you know, most likely to leave. So if we could come up with this, you know, with, with the reliable facts 
and then business teams can work with the required customers, right, to improve the customer relationship and retain them. I mean, it's a huge value add, right, for the business. So all these things now are possible. Business teams are thinking in this direction, right? Now more such advanced analytics, BI, ML use cases will be possible on the platform. Okay, so that brings me to the very end. Uh, if I have to summarize, right, uh, uh, what, what change such a platform has brought, uh, I mean, all of you are coming, I guess, from keynotes, so I don't need to, like, say, reiterate the importance of data and having a lake house or unified data platform, right? But really, I mean, if I talk from our experiences here, um, this has really transformed the way, you know, now business operates. So previously, they had a lot of manual processes. They, you know, would a lot of times even game up. Uh, when you you know they, they were asked to build analytics use cases, they did not feel motivated to look into data because they know they are going to have hard time to get data if they were asked to you know find new business opportunities. But obviously, all of these things are possible because now they have easy access to all the data from different sources at one place, right? And uh, the approach of of I can really say right from the experience that the approach has changed from being reactive to proactive by the business team, so they can really tap onto such data, they can start generating value out of it, right? So uh, having such a unified data platform really allows your business teams to invest more time into their core work, right? Uh, rather than uh, doing the heavy lifting of the data. So uh, with that, then I would like to stop here and thank you again all for joining and listening attentively and open up for Q&A if you have any.